Good morning. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gojo with Mike Gola Jr. That is me. With me, as always, starting a brand new week. Brandon Newman. What's going on, Brandon? Nothing much, Michael. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate being here with you. What do we have today? Brandon, what we have for you today, and this should surprise a lot of people, it's a great show. It's a great show. <laughs> we get to talk to our friend, Charlotte Wilder, uh, writer, podcast host, and Fox for uh, Fox Sports college football digital analyst uh, who has joined us on the show before, who is someone everyone knows and loves, anyone who enjoyed the most valuable podcast with her and Metal Arc Media's Jess Matana, the People Sports podcast from last fall. Uh, Charlotte is someone we very much know and love around here, and we'll hopefully see a lot more of this football season. Lots to get into with her as big time news this weekend about Tom Brady and what could have been with the Las Vegas Raiders rumors that he has been missing camp with the Buccaneers because he is in fact the mass singer and by reports he is supposed to be back at Bucks camp today so this saga sort of comes to an end for now and maybe mm. we'll get more answers um Got plenty of that. We delve even further into the Manti Teo documentary through the eyes of someone who saw it and didn't live it the way that we did in so many different ways. But, uh, Brandon, it also feels very much like we're as close to football season as we are. We are now in the lead-up to week zero of college football season. We will have actual college football games that mean something starting this weekend. Very excited about that, which is great because... I find my found myself yesterday wasting time letting the internet gaslighting me gaslight me into believing that the cut block administered to Kayvon Thibodeau, the Giants' rookie defensive end and one of their first round picks, was somehow a dirty play when in actuality it was something that happens all the time. And I had to watch legitimate football people try and convince me that it was otherwise. And I felt like I was going insane. And that's when I realized that I need a full slate of games so that I'm not hyper focused on the Bengals versus Giants in the preseason game and how terrible that can make me feel. Mike, why did everyone say it was dirty? Because it was one of those plays where the tight end goes across the formation and will on occasion cut block, block below the waist, the defensive end to oh, slow yeah. him down, uh -huh. especially if you've got a guy crashing off the backside. It's a good technique to slow down fast athletic defensive ends. It's a good way to mix it up to make defensive linemen think twice about how they're going to approach it. And it just happened to almost hurt Kayvon Thibodeau. He was... They brought the cart out for him. He walked off past it. They're going to have him get checked out. But by all accounts, he was laughing and joking on the sideline after that had happened. And because the results of the play were almost a young star player got injured, immediately everyone starts going to, this is a dirty play. Fine and suspend this man for what he's done. Uh, it was Thaddeus Moss, the... Uh, defensive end for oh really yeah. yeah it was Thaddeus Moss who did it in that situation and again it's a routine play that happens all the time Kayvon Thibodeau did not defeat the cut block in the way that you correct me if I'm wrong defensive linemen are often taught to like he very yeah. much saw it very much is aware of it and it very much was not a dirty play it was a legal play based on how the NFL still administers justice on that front and all of that said Again, it was just because it's a preseason game, he's a star player, and we are not yet in midseason form when it comes to digesting these things. People wanted to make this something that it wasn't, and I had to lose my mind briefly online. Also, it's a standard play you do when you have someone who is who you might think is better than you. It's like, I got to get this guy down. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and guess what? And, and like we said, or like, like Brandy says very famously, almost literally does not count. So let's let's every, let everyone chill. Yes, everyone, calm down. We're slowly but surely getting to the start of this season here. We're very much looking forward to that. So uh, stick with us. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we will talk about everything from this weekend in sports with our good friend Charlotte Wilder. <laughs> Won't he, Won't he do it? Good God did. Won't he? Won't oh he do God. it? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that Here is the sound of the dulcet tones of Charlotte Wilder, Fox Sports' very own, I mean, representative of college football on the digital front, writer and arbiter of concepts such as Is It Sports? And former podcaster with some podcasts that you have all loved over the years. Charlotte, how you doing, bud? I'm so good, guys. I'm so thrilled to be talking to you. I don't know if you guys feel this way, but 
the la- the two weeks before football to me they it, it's like the longest month of my life like waiting for football to start it feels like i used to feel with going back to school where i was like mm. can we just like can we just start this like you talk about it enough it's like you got preseason you got some sort of it's like let's just do the let's just do this it, it's so true and a few weeks ago, Charlotte, I feel like we finally made the switch from talking, especially in college football, which I want to get to whatever you can tell us about your upcoming plans for this fall. Very excited to see you back out covering college football for Fox. But in the last couple of weeks, I feel like for all of us on the college football front especially, NFL's had preseason, we've had plenty of stuff to go on, but with college, we finally had made that turn to focusing on the actual on-field football instead of conference realignment and TV contracts and all that stuff. Then the Big Ten TV deal dropped, and I was kind of like, no, no, like we're, we're done with this part. We're done. I just want to talk about the actual football stuff. Like Leave it alone here. So it, it's getting to that point where I'm like training camp antsy. Like I'm no good yes. to anybody right now. I didn't want to do anything this weekend. No, I totally, I know, I feel you. And I think you're right, though, that, you know, all the off-season, not gossip, but, like, news that gets a little petty that becomes a whole, like, that feels so necessary when you don't have games, but we're so close to games that it's like, can we just do the, can we just start, can we just have more games now? Guys, <laughs> I'm on the, zero. yeah, I'm, I'm on the exact opposite where I understand the the quicksand that is the football season. So I was like trying to do everything in this last weekend. Like for example, on Friday, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but Friday Night Lights, high school football gets started. I went to my alma mater, got the chance to see them uh, beat a team that was so bad that we never got to play. Like I would have set a sack record in Kentucky if we had played this (laughs) team back in the day. And then and then on Sunday, I took a surprise. Uh, my wife and my two little boys took them to the aquarium in Cincinnati, like took the little drive at Newport Aquarium. So I was out trying to get soak up those last moments before like it really is just Sunday and me yelling at my son, like, get away. It's fourth <laughs> down. Meta <Matt laughs> so, about the punt. <laughs> so wait, respect, respect to the punt guy. Yeah. But wait, I have a lot of questions coming off this now. First off, what was your approach at your alma mater's football game? Like, did you wear a le- did you wear the letter jacket? Were you standing down on the sideline? Did you try and just blend in? How did you go about? Because being an alum, especially one that played football and very well at that, kind of makes that an interesting dilemma when you go back. Now, obviously, I want to talk to Charlotte. We have Charlotte here, so I don't want to get too much into me. Oh, I want to uh-huh. hear it. I want to hear it. <laughs> but I didn't. I just. I just pulled up. I just pulled up, and I, when I got there, I found out that if I was following the Facebook br- group, that it was Hall of Fame night, where all the people were getting into the Hall of Fame. So I got to see uh, a lot of a lot of people. My my first head coach, and I only had him for two years, so I got a chance to take a picture with him. I'll show you guys later. Um, I look kind of fat in it, so I'm not sure if I'm going to post it. <laughs> and then um, and then I saw like old principals and old players and stuff like that. So it was, it was nice just seeing people, hugging people, um, but. I, I, I kept it low key. I kept it low key. I don't want to, you know, I don't ring the alarms or anything like that. It's been a couple generations since I've touched that special field. So I think people are just looking at me as if they like know me from YouTube versus knowing me from playing football at PRP. And it's a very real possibility at this point, right? It's the ice, it's the ice cube in uh, like 22 Jump Street or Ride Along theory. Like for some people of a certain age, that's just who he is. They have no idea about everything that preceded Absolutely. it. So, and my second question, because you went to the aquarium, what were the, do your kids already have favorite animals? Do you have ones you were more excited to show them? Because I mistook it for the zoo earlier, and I was thinking zoo animals when you told yeah, me. Yeah, Mike texted me, he's like, Brandon's at the zoo. And I was like, okay, well, just let me know what time you want me. <laughs> so listen, when Mike said he was top five zoo animals, I was like, I'm ready. Because I was like, <laughs> I've gotten well, do the, you have the, them? the zoos. I do have them, but I had to, I went to the zoo's cousin. The aquarium is basically the zoo's cousin. I, like I little, yeah, little I like aquariums school. more than zoos. Ooh, really? Why? Yeah, I think more. aquariums are nicer. I feel mm. better about going to an aquarium because I'm like this sea lion would not have survived in California. There's a sea lion I follow from the Mystic Connecticut Aquarium. <laughs> yes. Her name is Clara. Her name is Clara, and she can do tricks. <laughs> And she does, like, her little flippers, and she barks, and I'm not going to do the barking impression, but she's, she is the most delightful, like, you can't watch it and not just die laughing, so I really want to go see her. 
Are you sure you're not going to do the barking impression? Oh, please. Ar, 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 ar. <laughs> yes! Bravo! Snaps! And then she does one She does one that's like a really long sustain, like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> What a sweetheart. Oh, yeah. she's a, she yeah. sounds incredible. And she smiles. When she smiles, she looks like this. Okay, okay, <laughs> yes. She just, like, the top corners of her top lip go up, and you're like, are you good, or... Yeah. So I like Claire. I love aquariums. I will say this. Uh, spoiler alert. Top five zoo animals. Seals and sea lions was my number four. So they made my top five, so I'm glad you said that. Er, 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 er. Yes, we're on the er, same er, page. If they do have an elite noise. Like, it's very identifiable, some animals. Like, there's animals I've known my entire life. I don't know what noise deer make. Never hear deer talk. Oh, wow. <laughs> that really makes you think, Mike. And it's saying it fuck you up a little bit. It's like, I don't know. Like, yeah. I feel like deer just scream. Like, we all had that revelation at the same time when the screaming goat videos went viral and we found out that's just yeah. what they do. They freak out and pass out, but. Right. Freak yeah. out and pass out. Yeah. <laughs> it's like college. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> to answer your original question, oh uh, Carter's favorite animal, not one of his he loves a seahorse. Ooh. All right. He's a big horse fan in general. So the seahorses just, and he's got those little, you know how I many guys have fidgets, like fidget things, those little tubes that, that stretch out? Oh, I was thinking of a fidget spinner. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, those, all those things are considered fidgets. Those little bubbles, anything you do with your hands, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fidget, like oh. all that stuff's fidget. So that little, there's a tube thing now that I often make into a seahorse for him, <gasps> like a like a freaking clown. Oh, <laughs> like, fun! Like a blow -up clown. Yes. Oh so, man. Was good. Make me we, a bicycle clown. <laughs> you've reached that stage clown. in parroting where you're just an entertainer mm. for a small oh, audience. Absolutely. Oh, that's, oh, that's daddy the entire time, though. Mommy is the uh, everything else that's really important. <laughs> yes. Yeah, your wife, your wife, Michelle, the backbone of this entire operation and this podcast, oddly enough, which at some point <laughs> I'm sure she'll need to appear on here. So, all right, since we have a ton of stuff to talk with Charlotte about today, a uh, ton of stuff that happened over the weekend, I do want to give Charlotte a chance to do what everyone else in our life has done and ask us questions about the Manti Teo documentary, if there are any out there. Uh, Kamaru Usman got kicked in the face, and Tom Brady might yep. be the masked mm -hmm. singer. So we've got a lot to get yes. to, and I really oh, want to hear Charlotte's theory on that. But before we do all that, we've also got roses to hand out on Monday, which I made sure Char you know Charlotte is very, very ready for that. Brandon, I'm ready. Be before we do that, give us your top five zoo animals so that I can die happy. Okay, okay. Uh, let's start five. Penguins, love the little tuxedos, <laughs> love the, how they work in teams. It's all about, now when I do my top five zoo animals, it's about how much they love the exhibit as well and how much fun you have watching mm. them, right? So you see them, penguins jump in, get a little jet stream going on, hop right out, slide, and just, you know, they're fun people. Um, and then you got the they're sea lions people. and seals. <laughs> they are. <laughs> they got sea lions and seals, almost for the same reason. They'll put on a party just by accident. They see people enjoying them, they're like, all right, Let's get it going. Like they don't even need fish to get going. So love a seal. <laughs> um, another water one, ironically, polar bears at three. I don't know if you guys have seen it. <gasps> yep. If you have, if you get wow. a chance to get a get a polar bear playing with something just in the water, it's, they're, they're just a really really cool creatures. Love them. Elephants number two. <laughs> Uh, obviously, you get the baby, you get the mommy. Big exhibits. I mean, they're just so big. It's one of those things you just go and just gawk. You know what I mean? Like oh my gosh, I can't believe. Like what if these guys were here? You know. Um, and then, and then coming in number one, gorillas. Oh, it's a, it's, it's yeah. about the action. It's about what you're watching. It's about how close you get to it. Like they'll they'll fuck some shit up every now and then. Like it's it's kind of fun. And yeah, and we all remember Harambe, Brandon. Yeah, oh, yeah you right. can say his name. It's important. Yeah, Addison's, Addison's like Zoo. Five. Addison's yes. Candy Zoo. <laughs> so, oh my God! You just went and paid. Oh, no, you didn't, because you didn't go to the zoo. You went to the aquarium. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm boycotting the, t the yes. Cincinnati Zoo in honor of Harambe. Right. Until yeah. they put up the proper Harambe memorial service there. I'm with you on gorillas, though. Like, the most recent... I feel like they make the most meme-worthy zoo content, too. There was just that video of the gorilla power sliding over to the glass and showing off its ass to whoever was videotaping. <laughs> They're very sassy. <laughs> They're very uh, sassy. So I missed that one, but I see it. <laughs> I love that energy. 
I'm right. trying to think if there's anything that you really missed on there that I would beef with. Like, monkeys in general, I feel like. So maybe gorillas, it kind of falls into the same category. Super yeah. active. I like the birds, to be honest. I like some of the parrots that chirp at you and they say weird shit as you walk by. And you're like, did you just... And then, see, my problem with birds that talk is then I, I think that they understand what they're saying. Yeah, so I start right. being like, yeah, hey, what's up? And then they're like, hey, what's up? And I'm like, oh, how much? <laughs> well, like, are you? <laughs> and they're like, I'm a bird. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I actually really need someone to talk to right now. It's been a long week, and I was just wondering <laughs> if I could just yeah. sit here and vent to you for a little bit. Like, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, shout out to Hulu's Only Martyrs in the Building, by the way. This uh, feels like that's... Uh, you guys watching any of that? No. no. There's a talking bird on that show. Okay. Okay. You guys not big fans of Steve Martin and uh No, Selena huge Gomez. fan. I read, his, I read his autobiography. He is my comedy hero. Martin's but I think I got... I'm not going to lie. I think I was too jealous of Selena Gomez. I was like, why does this young woman get to be with Martin Short and Steve Martin? And I had to stop watching. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. It's, a per- it's a perfect reason to cut it off. Yeah, I'll be honest. I'm not proud. Listen, we we can, we ask everyone to come as they are. We don't need you to clean up your version or wash this over for us here. We love all. Yeah, cars. I already told you my top five cargo planes. Like, come on, guys. Uh, there's we're past yeah. that. If anyone if anyone was surprised that Charlotte copped to following a sea lion on Instagram, lest we point you to the last episode of the podcast where she has admitted and brought to us the fullest version of herself, and we're eternally yeah. thankful for it. So at Gojo Thank Show so on much. Twitter, uh, if you want to chime in on Brandon's top five zoo animals here and see uh, if there's any improvements you can make to what I think is a pretty rock solid list here. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before we do get to anything else, and this is just because we were talking about it beforehand, obviously we talked about the Manti Teo documentary on Netflix a little bit last week. I have spent every day since that documentary has come out fielding calls, text messages, or radio interviews from somebody. And so, Charlotte, I just wanted to make sure if there were any questions that you had about the documentary, anything that was on your mind, we would give you the floor on that to ask because this is basically what we've been for everyone at this point. It's our duty as former teammates and people that lived through that weird era of Notre Dame football where we all got accused of not dating real girls. (laughs) Oh, that's what I want to know about, but... uh... No, I think, you know, my question as I sat there watching it, first of all, I do have one key take from this whole thing, which is that, you know, at at the time, I remember being just so confused. I was like, I don't understand how someone could talk to somebody they don't know, or have never met, and call them their girlfriend, let alone for that long. How would he call... Like, it, it was so new then it, that watching it now... It struck me as just such a moment of its time, right? Like, it was an age where now I think a lot of people meet online and then start dating. I think that's not... It's like the way now. (laughs) Yeah, I don't think people think it's weird if you're like, yeah, we haven't met in person yet, but I like this person. Back then, it was like, I'm sorry, you met on Facebook, but you don't actually know them. And then you... And and you... This has been going on for three years. Like... It, it was just, it's still a little baffling, that aspect of it, but it really struck me as, like, the the media culture we were in then, the, the dating culture, the sort of nascent internet, like, knowing people, but it was still a little embarrassing to, like, only know people from online. And so I just, watching back, I was like, oh, this was, like, the perfect storm of all these factors coming together to just blow up. It was still, like, the talk show era. Like, Katie Couric had Katie or whatever. Like, it was so weird. It was, like, linear and digital were crashing into each other and nobody knew what to do. And, like, you could argue that they still don't. But back then, it was just, like, the wild, wild west. Charlotte, you hit perfectly on it. Because, Mike, I don't know if you remember this. We saw Catfish, the, the documentary film, in class, right? And this was like sophomore year, wow. right? I think junior year and senior year is when Neve and them was putting out Catfish, the TV show. And that was when it like started to really get pushed in, into the lexicon. So it was a very interesting time where like it didn't really make much sense because while that was going on, also Chat Roulette was going on. Yeah, right? Like, that was a dangerous time. Like, that, like bad things were going on on the internet, and nobody 
really knew what to call it or how to talk about it because I think that especially among age differences, it was like embarrassing for parents were like, oh my God, my kids on the internet, what? This is awful. Like no one was like, hey, be careful because there are bad people out there. It was like, just don't like go into the computer room or whatever. But I think my main question to you guys, like watching it, I kept being like, oh my God, I got to ask Mike and Brandon about this is in the locker room, like they painted such a picture of him as like this guy of the guy of carrying Notre Dame football. And that felt largely like the media narrative at the time. Like, I don't feel that the doc actually dove into, there weren't interviews with other Notre Dame players. No one was like, Hey, what was the vibe in the locker room? Like in general, but also in relation to him. Yeah. I would say, I would say this is as far as like carried in the football sense, he was a huge part of the success of that season. I will say like we were a defensive led football team. We were for most of the season, like the number one defense in almost every metric there. And when you got an off ball linebacker with seven interceptions, that's usually going to go a long way as to why. Mike, you, well, let's talk about, <clears throat> we don't have to talk about, but there were a lot of other defensive players that got drafted on that team oh listen I'm not saying it wasn't because there weren't good players everywhere we had especially in that front seven a lot of like top top four round draft picks that were loaded in that so he wasn't the only one but again what he did was like very unique and very like we looked up at one point I saw some of those numbers and I was like Jesus Christ and the fact that he's right now like third on Notre Dame's all-time tackling list behind my uncle Bob and Bob Crable is pretty wild like those are (laughs) Those are big time names. Like those dudes could play some ball, yeah. but um, the rest of it, like the vibe, was honestly. And this was the part I always tell people: is number one, that season was so cluttered and chaotic for all of us because we hadn't won like that before. We were all dealing right. with new problems over the course of that year. Like I'll never forget coming right. back from break during bowl season and having people waiting at the gate when we got off the plane. I didn't even know you could still do that post nine eleven. <laughs> And waiting, waiting for us at the gate with like football helmets and memorabilia to sign inside they, like, of the airport. Bought tickets and gone through security to meet you. They had to have because, like, again, even at like, South Bend Small shit. Airport, this is post nine eleven security. You can't smoke in the airport and say goodbye to your relatives at the gate at that point. So, all that to <laughs> illustrate, like. Shit changed very rapidly for all of us. And, like, Manti just wasn't a guy I was that close with in the locker room. So, for me, when I heard, yeah, he had some long-distance girlfriend who he would, like, you know, do the fall asleep on the phone with thing at night that people did, I was like, all right, like, if, if you want to do that, be my guest, man. Like, I've never I've never met this girl. All we heard was the same thing everyone else was, which, you know, he, like, met her out in one of the West Coast trips when we played Stanford or SC. And, you know, life went on. I was like, all right, like, if that's what you want to do, go ahead. You're not one of my close friends. I'm not really going to look into this any more than I need to. And then when we got the news that, you know, Manti's very real grandmother had passed away. And then on that same day, (sighs) Lene had reportedly passed away. It was just like when any of our other teammates had suffered a loss. You know, you rallied around him. I remember Manti bringing it up at the end of practice that day. And Coach Kelly kind of let him say a couple of words to the team. And, you know, we all just, you know, tried to be there for our teammate. We'd had a bunch of guys, unfortunately, who had lost older relatives or lost parents while I was there. And so it was something that is not without precedent. And, you know, any locker room or any friend group. But then from there, what it became media-wise with the coverage there, what a focus it was for him versus what it was for us on a day-to-day who... I was where I mean, week two of that season, I got sat down and basically told if my play didn't improve, I wasn't going to be starting anymore. So I had other shit I was worried about right. other than what college game day wanted to do stories on when they came. So I, I would say that is always the thing that stuck out for me is we were aware of it. We were sensitive to it in the ways that we thought we needed to be as teammates, but it didn't preoccupy the locker room the way, especially in this documentary, it made it seem like it preoccupied everything else. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that's sort of what I was wondering is like how much of this is a convenient narrative too for the doc, I think. Yeah, I mean it's a good reminder that this was a docu- like this was a documentary that Manti, I, I'd imagine, had a pretty clear hand in. Like, we remember Don Van Nott at ESPN was doing a backstory piece on this for ESPN that was supposed to feature Manti, and they said publicly that Manti, you know, pulled out of that at the last minute. And so that lost a lot of steam. And Manti in this one had the chance to make sure that he felt like his version of events was represented here. Yeah. And you've seen, like, it was very effective PR because online, I mean, the Q rating for 
Manti and the way people look back at that, which in general is a good reminder that dogpiling on people and getting jokes off at all costs the way we do with athletes in a lot of circumstances probably isn't the coolest thing in the world and can have a pretty negative impact on people. But (laughs) this was a documentary that was very much told from his vantage point and really it felt like his vantage point alone. Well, one thing that I just, I wish was driven home more was the thing that Deadspin was trying to do. And that's probably the last time you'll hear me say that. But like the fact that so many reputable sports news sources were reporting information that wasn't verified. Yeah. Well, that whole part for me, go ahead, Mike. Well, I was just going to say, it is ironic that Deadspin did that and then basically put in that article in a way that was unverified that he might have been in on it, which then allowed other people to go after that. Like, Deadspin Deadspin really tripped over the goal line on that one. But you're right. The fact that no one along the way, like, think about before we played in the national championship. How natural would it have been for any of those big-time entities to say, man, it'd be a really interesting piece to talk to Lene's family about what this season has meant to them, with Manti keeping their daughter's name out in the public light, playing as well as he has, like, that's just, like, forget, like, human decency or background. That's just, like, the normal way that the college, like, media in general thinks about storytelling in events where you've got 40 days in between the last game of the season and the championship. Like, that stunned me. And I think that there's a lot of, I mean, I feel this way. Like, if this were happening now, I would be like, yeah, we got to go track down that that girl's family because yes. i mean because a it's a good story b it's the other side of the story c it would be a huge get for whoever got that are you kidding right. me like I, I don't think anybody can pretend what i liked about you know i actually i worked with jack dickey at, at sports illustrated and we sat next to each other and he's he's great um and i think that watching it i liked that they didn't pretend that they were being like altruistic like I think they were like look we were trying to point out something about media coverage but also like we wanted to be first so we published it like that nobody says that and I think that we like you're that's such a huge part of the whole thing to me that's just there were so many blind spots I think Manti clearly had blind spots that I still find you know, I don't know whether it was just someone with a good nature who was totally taken for a ride. I don't know whether there was willful ignorance. Like, I can't psychoanalyze him. I don't know what was going. I'm not. I'm not going to be like, oh, was he in on it? Like, that's not what I'm saying. But I think that there were so many blind spots in the media, and then so many blind spots in the further coverage of it, and then everybody just decided that this kid was awful and he's a 21 year old kid like just let him play football like I I really don't think now this would be I guess it would be a story but I think it would be framed differently I think it really would be more like hey how did this slip through the cracks as opposed to like maybe Manti Teo's gay which is like an insane place to take this publicly in like it's just it was all so nuts yeah I I think that's the biggest part for me is At the end, when they were talking about how he was listed along Lance Armstrong and a couple other people as the most hated athletes in there, that only exists once they've been given liberty to think, oh, was he in on this, which never should have been the implication, and he never should have been hated. Like, And I was talking to someone about this today. A lot of the jokes that got off in the time after that seemed to be predicated more on the naivete that we talked about in this. The right. fact that you would mm-hmm. believe something like that, the concept of a fake girlfriend or being catfished in general, right. but the people that decided to take it to that next place of, oh, this is a bad person because of what's happened was always the part that felt like a bridge too far for me. So I'm with you on that. Yeah. yeah it's- I'm, I'm just... It was troubling to see how much of a person, how much he's shifted as a person yeah. through this. Like, obviously, being hurt and things like that, but to hear about those first three seasons with the Chargers, um, like, I, there's so much stuff that Manti could, have be, could be evaluated for on the field between the lines, and he ended up having to answer for a lot of the things that are outside of the lines, which is common For a lot of people going into the draft, especially ones getting drafted high, there's a lot of things, a lot of big red flags that should have pumped his brakes at some point in time. And this is always us looking back in the thing. But like for me in that Heisman moment, I would have loved to him to talk about when he lost his grandmother in that moment. Like that's someone who he 
who we would think is very important to him, right? So like, that was my thing is like, there's all the things I do, I feel bad for him, Lene Kakua, whoever that person is, or like that person was a piece of shit. The fact that they really just like, after everything blew up, left, like no, like you, you ruined this person's life. You were very active in this thing. You were a freaking deserve the EGOT and how you did it. Right, yeah. with the switching oh of the voices God. and all that stuff. The Insane. the part where they handed the phone and was doing the nurse's voice and then the breathing while like supposedly dying voice was wow. gripping wow. theater. Gripping theater. No, I, I think I think that there's also you know I don't think what I've seen people say is it's way sexier to talk about a young girlfriend dying than a grandmother dying. And yeah. I think there's something really gross about how it all got framed. And, right, right. you know, I think when you're, I think when you're reporting on any, any of this, it, like, especially, and I try to keep this in mind doing college football, like these are kids. Yeah. These are, these are, these are kids. Yeah. If you put me in that situation when I was 21, I like, thank God we didn't even have Instagram in college, you know? And, and so I think that there's a, a real, responsibility to try to game out like where do we think this is going to go when you when you publish something when you air a story when you go, have someone on your talk show even like but i you know i also think that it was such a i just can't see it happening the same way and and it's heartbreaking because of that like i the saddest part i agree brandon the saddest part for me was when he was talking about the anxiety attacks playing with the chargers um you know i've dealt with major anxiety in my life and it's it is a it is like a completely physical experience and so him talking about it's like god this this guy could have been so good like what if he had not and and it was just this confluence of factors, as you said, of the of sheltering. But it's also like, what responsibility does a university have to take care and protect the narrative of their students? Like, I don't know. I think that there are a lot of forces that were so much bigger than any one player, and he was in the exact right place at the exact wrong wrong time. Meaning in culture too it was yeah. like the, this i don't think this explodes if if any of the factors there are different yeah I, I think you're right everyone it's weird because you can look at the situation and even with manta i say everyone had some agency in the way that this turned out right like everyone fed into this in their own way and everyone also gets a little bit of bail for certain things because what you mentioned there charlotte about the powder keg that you need and the right spark to light this thing is that you're right in the initial storytelling of this how that's framed was important. What I will give the initial storytellers is bail because this happened the week we played Michigan State. That was the first ranked win we ended up having that season. We were unranked to start that year. We were one of like the handful of teams in the last decade that went from unranked to ranked in the top 10. We were number one at the end of the season, which is to say no one thought we were going to be as good as we were. And so now all of a sudden a story that's reported on there at this brief moment where it looks like, all right, Notre Dame's got something, this is a really good player for them, turns into this is a guy that is statistically leading a team that happens to be going on a run that's like 30 years in the making based on how Notre Dame football had had this gulf and big top-end production. So that's always the part of it I remind people is in addition to what you said about the age, it's a lot of stuff had to go right for the scope of this to kind of be totally. what it was. Oh, yeah. I mean, shortly after the Michigan State, was it not the – Sam Bradford, Oklahoma team at Oklahoma that you guys beat? It was like, it was like we had Michigan State, we had Oklahoma, we had the Stanford goal line stand stuff. I mean, whoop the shit out of like USC were, at the end. Yeah, like the yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was, but yeah, that was, that was the beginning of it. So, Charlotte, to your point about how that was framed and where it went from there, I even look at that and go, all right, you know what? For a storyteller there and trying to figure out like where this goes, very few people could have seen where our team was going happening. Also, I have one more question, Mike, for you about that run. Was that is, is that something that you look back on? I can't imagine the exhilaration of, of the, like going from unranked to the title game 
is an insane thing to be a part of. And I always think to myself, whenever there's something real in sports where people are like, you couldn't write it like a movie. Like the writer's room would toss you out because that's not believable, which also like we need to stop doing that because it's just the worst. (laughs) But I'm always interested when you see one of these like magical stories, which sports give us, which we are very lucky to have. And I wonder what it's like to be inside. Like, is it fun? Is it terrifying? Is it, what does it feel like? Um, honestly, it's always so much more micro than any of that. Because as, as you guys know, who have like ever been through like a hard thing or like grinded through a season of any kind with a job or with a sport, it's, you're so worried about what's going on day to day and what I act like. Right. It's, it's all the tired cliches, but that season for me is fun to look back on going through it. I was an anxious mess. Like, it was my first time being a full-time starter. I had started the back half of the season before because of injury. And so I was worried about every week doing what I had to do to keep my job. I was in a, you know, it was my fifth year, so all the guys I had come in with were gone, which meant I was an old guy on campus. My sister was on campus now. I felt aged out of a lot of things. I was basically a pro athlete because I was taking nine credits. And so my job was football. And as each successive mm-hmm. week went on, I was focused on, all right, God, am I, am I making sure my weight's still up? Am I doing the right things there? Am I performing well? You know, what's going to go on in this practice today that I need to be ready for? And all the while, like, it was a season that had a fun result, but as you you hear the guys from Alabama who do winning on that level very regularly and as part of a system, they all say you think you want it like that until you actually go through it. And then you find out if you really want to do the things necessary. And finding out what's necessary to win at that level was a shock for us because we hadn't done it yeah. like that. And it requires yeah. so much more of you on a day-to-day basis that you, I, I get why guys like Belichick and Saban and all them always balk at being asked like, big picture retrospective questions because if you're thinking like that you're fucked like you have no chance to do the things necessary to do if your focus isn't on what is actually needed from me right in this very second and how much more of it you know for us we were learning how much more we had to give to get those results and so that's kind of what i learned remember there were moments where we got to enjoy it like I'll never forget the night we actually moved up to number one in the rankings. Stanford was playing Oregon, and uh, Kansas State, who was ranked number one at the time, was playing Baylor. And our game had been earlier in the day. They were both night games. And so we were all in a bar. My parents were there. Like, it was packed. Like, it was CJ's Pub in South Bend. It was the football bar. And we've got one game on one TV and one game on the other. And... Kansas State's in a barn burner against like shitty Baylor, not even good RG3 Baylor, bad Baylor that they shouldn't have lost to. So they go down and then the Stanford and Oregon game comes down to a field goal where um, they end up getting toppled there. And we all had the realization at the same time inside the bar. And, like, my parents went joyriding around campus in their golf cart screaming, we're number one. And we all were getting ready (laughs) at Notre Dame on top of one of the buildings called Grace Hall. There's a big wooden number one with lights on it. And anytime one of the teams on campus is ranked number one in their sport, they say light up Grace Hall. And so we all kind of knew what that meant and got to have that moment there, got to have that moment after we beat SC. But the rest of that season was a lot of anxiety. (laughs) That's... I'm so glad to hear you say it. I, Charlotte, I'm glad that you asked them that because I've never asked them that because <clears throat> men don't talk to their friends. Uh, but <laughs> also to, to hear that and the level of uh, sacrifice and, and pressure and anxiety. And then, Mike, I think about Manti in that situation. Right. Right? Like, aside from getting uh, linebacker tips from a, a fake girlfriend, like, he had to be going through so much... Because yeah. everything was on him. Yes. Yeah. And, and again, that's that's the part. And Charlotte, you were right to bring it up. Like 21. Anytime we deal with young athletes and things, I'm always like, just remember where you were at 21. And if everyone yeah. gave you the world and been telling you you were the man since you were a freshman on campus, how would you think, respond, and react to things? And it might not always be the way you'd like to think you would respond or the way you'd want someone to right. respond, but thinking about that realistically is a tough exercise but it's important given the situation yeah something that i say all the time and i don't know if i've said it on the podcast before with you guys is that um my dad told me when i was really little i think i must have been like 10 or 11 and he said to me he was like you know environment determines way more about an individual's behavior than their individual character does 
And at the time, I remember being like, there's no way that's true. Because, you know, it was about the time that I discovered, I was like reading about World War II and like the Holocaust. You know, my mom's family is Jewish. And so I had these hero fantasies of like, well, if I'd been there, like I would have gone out and fought or like I would, you know, and I, I couldn't quite understand it. I heard it. And then I think there've been so many instances in my life where that has proved to be true with myself, both in good ways and bad ways. There there have been ways where I've been like, I'm going to, I'm not going to let the environment shape how I react. And there have been times where I've totally let the environment shape how I react. And I think actually getting older is just, or, or maturing is learning how to maintain your integrity in a number of different environments. But when you're 21, that's, that's impossible. And I think that that's something people don't talk enough about in sports and like that's why i think the Bengals were so good last year because they they lucked into a great environment that goes so much farther than people talk about and so if you take this kid in this pressure cooker with his own you know everybody can you sign this can you sign that can you be this for me can you projecting things out like it's a miracle that he made it even to the championship game it's a it's a double edged sword though too because it's it's the same argument that the people that don't want college athletes right now to have any autonomy say about NILs right there's like they're too young they don't know what they're doing they're they're making decisions that are are bigger than them at this point in time like they're 19 right there's there's it both things they are also true. is agency like right. these people they're still people yep yeah yeah absolutely a hundred percent I also no. think any time that anybody can get paid for for yeah. work they're doing, that all those arguments should go out the window. <laughs> yeah, I, I can say, oh, if you're doing work, you should get paid. <laughs> just as a general principle here, if you're doing, in this case, quite literally backbreaking labor, maybe it's a good yeah. idea to be compensated Ooh. in some way, shape, or form for what goes on. That's an excellent point, uh, Charlotte. <laughs> and God, what a what a weird time in history. Um, all right, tell you what, we're gonna take a quick break here, take a quick breather. And when we come back on the other side of this, we're going to hand out some roses for what happened this actual weekend in sports and not a decade plus ago. 